This is video number three of the five video set that will explain confidence intervals to you. Be sure to watch all five. In the first video, we learn the fundamental idea on how a confidence interval is able to give us an estimate of the population mean. In the second video, we learn how to calculate a 95% confidence interval for the population mean when the population standard deviation is known. Now, we will learn how to get a confidence interval for the population mean using any confidence level, such as 98%, 90%, etc. You will need to bear with me in this video as I once again assume we know the value of the population standard deviation. You're probably getting pretty sick and tired of that assumption. Well, in the next video, Confidence Intervals Part 4, I will finally address that issue. Let's use the same random sample that we've used in the earlier videos, but this time, let's change the confidence level to 98%. Come on, wouldn't you rather be 98% confident rather than only 95%? But what will that do to the width of the interval? Will it make it wider or narrower? We shall see, won't we? We have taken a random sample of 36 fish from a huge lake. The sample mean is 8.25 inches. And the population standard deviation is assumed to be known to equal 2.25 inches. We wish to create a 98% confidence interval for the population mean. The only thing that is going to be different in this video number three from what we did in video number two, confidence intervals part two, is we will be using a different critical value Z. That's it. No, really. To determine what our critical value Z is equal to, the wisest thing a student can do is to make a sketch. Take whatever your confidence level is, 98% in our case, and sketch this area so that it is centered in the middle of the standard normal distribution. Then refer to your sketch to help you visualize what you are doing. It makes a big difference when you are learning this material. In fact, here's a quote that you can quote me on. A miserable wretch never makes a sketch. If we have 98% centered in the middle, what would the total area in the two tails have to be? 100% minus 98% equals 2%. And since we have exactly half of this in each tail, what is the area in each tail? 2% divided by 2 equals 1%. Remember that the critical value is the z-score that separates the middle 98% that's closest to the center from the 2% that is furthest from the center. It tells us how many standard errors we need to go above and below the center in order to contain the middle 98%. Now, if the area to the right of our critical value is 1%, what would the area to the left have to be? 100% minus 1% equals 99%. So our critical value is at the 99th percentile, because 99% of the distribution is less than it. Now that you know the area to the left of our critical value Z is 0 0.99, you can use the standard normal distribution table to look up this Z score. In this table, you hunt for the closest match to our 99th percentile critical value. The closest match to 0 0.9900 is 0 0.9901. So combine the row heading, 2.3, with the column heading, 0 0.03, to get 
2.33. So our critical value is 2.33. Now we know that we need to go 2.33 standard errors above and below the population mean in order to contain the middle 98% of all the possible sample means we could ever possibly get. Using the standard normal table, we have to settle for a critical value that only goes out to the second decimal place. Let's also calculate it using our TI-8384 calculator. Press the second key, then the VARS key, then press 3 to select inverse norm. The first value it needs is the area to the left, which is 0 0.99. Press the comma key. Then we can enter 0 for the center of the standard normal distribution. Press the comma key. And then enter 1 for the spread. Press the right parenthesis key. And then press the enter key. If we round off at the fourth decimal place, we get a critical value of 2.3263. We are ready to plug in our values into the formula for the margin of error E. When you look at this formula, you should review what each part represents. It's always a good idea to review the concepts. This little piggy is the critical value, which tells you how many standard errors you need. And this little piggy tells you the size of the standard error. And when you multiply these two little piggies together, you get the distance you need to go above and below the population mean in order to contain the middle 98% of all the possible sample means that you could ever possibly get. Oh, that was a nice review. Now let's plug the values into our equation. We replace the critical value Z with 2.3263, the population standard deviation with 2.25, and the sample size with 36. Plug these values in and do the calculation and you will get the margin of error E is equal to 0 0.872 of an inch. Now all we need to do is take this margin of error E, 0 0.872 of an inch, and subtract it from the sample mean, 8.25 inches, to get the lower bound of our confidence interval. Then add the margin of error E to the sample mean to get the upper bound of our confidence interval. We will round our answers off to the same number of decimal places as the data that was given to us. In the last video number 2, Confidence Intervals Part 2, we used a 95% confidence level and ended up with an interval between 7.52 and 8.99 inches. That interval is narrower than our 7.38 and 9.12 inches when using 98% confidence. Does it make intuitive sense to you that if the interval is wider, you will be more confident that it will contain the population mean? And does it make intuitive sense to you that if the interval were narrower, you will be less confident that it will contain the population mean? Let's look at a Java applet to demonstrate this. Let's go to the website www.singstatistics.com and click on Enter Sing Statistics. Click on Contents. Click on Inference and Confidence. Click on 8.4 Confidence in the Estimate. And then click on 4. Look 
what happens when we move this scroll bar. What is happening to the confidence level as we decrease the width of the confidence interval? It's getting lowered because we are less confident that such a small interval will actually contain the population mean. What is happening to the confidence level as we increase the width of the confidence interval? It is increased because as the interval gets wider, we are more confident that it will contain the population mean. You are now ready for the next video, Confidence Intervals Part 4, the one you've been waiting for, which will show you how to find the confidence interval for the population mean when the value of the population standard deviation is not known. And after that, you can watch video number 5, Confidence Intervals Part 5. Use my video to keep you alive to show you how to find the confidence interval for the population proportion instead of the mean. After that, you will be the master of confidence intervals. So rather than you doing confidence intervals with a high level of confidence, you will be doing them with smugness. You'll probably be calling them smugness intervals. Now get going! You got two more movies to watch!